Welcome everyone, I am Pulsifex, a longtime speedrunner of the Pokemon series. And I'm here to teach you how to start speedrunning Pokemon Fire at Leaf Green. This tutorial is mainly meant for entry level players, but if you don't know how to do the latest methods on RNG manipulation with the latest tool flow timer, feel free to stick around. Let's get started. First thing I would like to cover is a couple of different things about Pokemon Fire Red and Leaf Green. First things first, there are six different routes for this game, meaning that you can run all three starters if you choose to in any percent, or you can go into Fire Red Round 2, run it with Zapdos, Mewtwo, or Charmander. For now, we're going to be focusing on the current main route, which is Squirtle any percent. As for version differences, the biggest difference between the two is if you have Fire Red and you want to run both categories, well, you happen to be in luck. Round 2 and any percent can be run with Fire Red, and Round 2 happens to be a little bit faster with Fire Red. Leaf Green, however, ends up being a little bit better than Fire Red in terms of any percent. It's because later on in the game, you end up teaching the HM Strength to Blastoise, as you don't really have anybody else who can essentially learn it, and because Sandshrew gets a free space, in his inventory typically you don't have to teach over another move plus you could actually teach it to Sandshrew as you teach Blizzard over to Blastoise making it very efficient and slightly faster this is a little bit situational though so if you happen to own Fire Red or Leaf Green don't be discouraged to run one or the other as this is a very minor difference and it really doesn't make a huge amount of difference Next, I'd like to point you all over to a couple of rules and console differences. Head on over to speedrun.com slash pkmnfrlg. I will leave a link down in the description. Feel free to go over the rules before you do decide that you want to speedrun this. Consoles in this game are essentially preference when speedrunning Fire Red Leaf Green. Original DS, Nintendo GameCube, Game Boy Interface are all legitimate ways to submit to the leaderboards. Emulator is also allowed, but due to the inaccuracies of Game Boy Advance emulation, it is hidden by default on their leaderboards as of today. If this does change, I will also release an update video, so be on the lookout for that. So, as for techniques for this route, besides learning the route as a whole, there is a single technique that you must really learn and get used to whenever speedrunning Pokemon Fire Red Leaf Green, and this is kind of one of the biggest hurdles, as this game does run at about 60 FPS, meaning that essentially you have only a few milliseconds to actually press A to manipulate the starter Pokemon. Now this does sound complicated at first, but with proper timing and practice you should get this down in no time. Now here are a couple things you are going to need for this RNG manipulation. First thing is, is the Generation 3 Manipulation Program, Flow Timer, and the latest version of Java. I will leave a link in the description for all three of these, and if it just so happens that Java decides that they want to get rid of their latest version of Java that works for Flow Timer, I'm going to leave another link in the description for a backup. So this program probably looks a little bit complicated at first, but once you know what options to set, it's very easy to pretty much input these every single time. And you'll get the uh, same exact options every single time you have to do this. So let me go ahead and show you what options to put in. First off, we're going to pick Squirtle as our starter. Minimum frame will be 4200 for anyone starting off. 4040 if you happen to be a bit of a veteran in terms of Pokemon speedrunning. 5300 for maximum frame. Check mark modest nature, mild nature, rash nature. Head over to the IV constraints. In the attack constraints, we want to put six blank blank. Leave defense completely blank. Special attack will be blank blank 28. Special defense will be completely blank. Speed blank 16 blank. The trainer ID section, we're going to go ahead and leave blank for now. Later on when we go into the game, we'll receive what trainer ID we use each time we go into a new game. And this will be pretty much different every single time we go into the game. So again, for now, we're just going to leave it blank. So the options you see before you essentially represent the minimum stat requirements 
Require to speedrun Pokemon Fire Red Leaf Green any percent with a Squirtle. To kind of compensate for the Squirtle evolutionary lines, mediocre special attack and speed sets, we can only unfortunately run Rash, Mild, or Modest with at least a 28 to 31 IV special attack, meaning 3 out of 25 natures and 4 out of 31 total IVs in special attack are runnable in this game. Quiet, unfortunately, also isn't an option, even though it does have godly special attack much like the others. Unfortunately, even at 31 speed IVs, it just isn't enough to outspeed some of the most dangerous threats throughout the speedrun. As for the frame section on this program, 4200 is a pretty good place to start off for beginners, but once you start getting more and more used to the manipulation, you kind of want to lower that number very slowly. 4040 is pretty much the base minimum that I would go to, as it takes about that long to get through the intro screen, look at the trainer ID, and then reach the Pokeball containing Squirtle. So, Pretty much, once you start getting used to this, just lower it once you're a little bit more confident in the manipulation. The maximum frame, I personally pick 5300. If you end up making this maximum frame a little bit too low, you may be sitting there for hours as you might not get a lot of squirtles that actually meet the criteria and end up having at least enough defense, enough attack, enough special defense or HP or even speed to actually be able to compete with the best of the best. And if you're not competing for the best of the best, you may still end up dying a lot because you can't get enough Squirtles on this list. So keep that in mind. So the next program I'm going to go ahead and explain is Flow Timer. Flow Timer is a program essentially made to make RNG manipulation easier and more consistent. By inputting what frame our Squirtle is going to be at, we can start a background timer that counts down to the exact second, the exact millisecond, the exact frame we need to press A on to successfully receive the Squirtle with amazing stats. Once the timer is nearly counted all the way down to the frame you put into the timer, an audio and or visual cue will pop up on the screen depending on what settings you put. So before we start beginning to set up flow timer, make sure that you have the latest version of Java installed. You, this will only work with at least Java 10 and up. If you try to launch this program without Java 10 and up, unfortunately it's not even going to launch and you're going to be a little bit sad. One thing that's important about this timer to know is the difference between fixed offset and variable offset. Fixed offset is usually manipulation meant for ruby, sapphire, emerald, hard gold, soul silver, any other game but fire red. Fire red is one of the very few games that actually has a variable offset. Because the offset is going to be different every single time you play this game, it is important that we actually start the timer that is on the variable offset section. Now let's go ahead and begin with the settings for flow timer. Go ahead and click on settings. On the start section, set up whatever hotkey you'd like to use to start a flow timer. For me, that's going to be spacebar as it's one of the easiest buttons I can press on my keyboard. The stop section will stop the timer if you set a hotkey to it. I personally just leave it unset, but this is totally up to preference. Up and down will essentially move you up and down on the timer option, so feel free to leave these, whatever they are. The beep section is the sound flow timer will produce your audio cue with. My personal preference for this is to set it to ping 2, as personally, in my opinion, this is the most pleasing to my ears in terms of all the other beeps. The final three options are also preference. For me personally, I feel both an audio cue and a visual cue together help me focus on the manipulation, so I turn that on. Global start and stop will cause the timer to activate even if it's not the primary program you have up on your screen. So let's say that your first program is going to be live split. If you have this set to, let's say, the space bar, keep that in mind every single time as this will activate the timer even if you don't want it to activate. And if this is a problem for you, just make sure that your start key is just something that essentially you're not going to be using to type. Next, go over to FPS and set it to 
59.8261 if you're on a Nintendo DS, 59.7275 if you're on Nintendo GameCube or emulator. Beeps are the number of beeps you will hear when your timer counts the number of frames you put into the timer. Here's an example of how that works. For me, I personally like to leave this at 5, as it's kind of the default for everybody and kind of what I'm used to. If you're used to something else or you have a preference on what you prefer the number of beeps to be counted down from, don't feel ashamed to change this. And finally, we're at the most fun section of them all, offset. Offset is the number of milliseconds the timer takes off to compensate for how inconsistent this RNG manipulation can be. And the reason why this is inconsistent is because when NPCs decide that they want to move left, right, up and down, whatever direction they decide to look or move up towards, your timer is going to be a little bit off. So in order to compensate for that, we need to set an offset. For example, if you start off with an offset of zero and you find that you're consistently about two frames off from getting your squirtle, so you would think that we would essentially just have to put two in here because it's two frames off, right? Unfortunately not, as this offset is actually in milliseconds. So in order to find the amount of frames and milliseconds we are off by, we need to learn how to calculate frames based on our amount of FPS in a very simple equation. That equation is going to be one divided by your FPS times 1000. And this is what's going to equal the milliseconds per frame. So if you're on Nintendo DS, use this equation. If you're on a Nintendo GameCube or emulator or Game Boy interface, use this equation. From here, all you really have to do is multiply this equation's answer by the amount of frames you're off by. So let's take for example that we were late by two frames constantly. All you have to do again is multiply the answer to this equation, which is 16.742706458. Then multiply that by 2, and it'll equal up to 33 with a bunch of decimal numbers at the end. Essentially, from here, all you have to do is get rid of the decimal, put the whole number in, so 33, and then we're good from there. And if you happen to have a negative offset, just put a minus in front of it, and you're pretty much good to go from there. Again, if you need help calculating your own offset, feel free to leave a comment below as I know this is a pretty complicated part of the speedrunning process. So now that we're done setting up both programs, we have our offset ready to be calculated and we are pretty much ready to go. Let's go on ahead and show you how to put these two programs together. So let's go ahead and go into our game. So you remember that trainer ID section? Let, let's put up a bit of an example for that. So let's say that we get trainer ID number 24415. We're going to go ahead and put that program into the trainer ID section, 24415, and then hit the search button at the bottom left. So as you can see, the trainer ID we just entered acted as a seed, and it produced an entire listing of Squirtle. So now what we can do from here is we can go ahead and click on the list and use our up and down arrow keys to search for an amazing Squirtle. On your left, you'll see IVs, and on your right, you'll see level 5 stats. And now that we have this entire list, we can actually attempt to RNG manipulate this list of Squirtles with Flow Timer by plugging in the frame number on the left side of the list, right here. So now that I've explained everything, let's finally get into the game. So, we're gonna go ahead and start our splits from the new game menu. Do not start up flow timer just yet. Pretty much the intro screen or the entire new game process, it does not matter whatsoever. The only important part of the intro is going to be the naming screen. This is what's important. Go ahead and name yourself A. Press start so that your cursor is on the OK button on the naming screen. Have your fingers ready on your A button and whatever hotkey you use to start a flow timer. Get ready to sync your fingers together. Start it up in three, two, one, now. If you press them both at the same time, you're off to a good start. If 
you happen to mess up the sync of your A button and your flow timer start key, that's okay. All you have to really do is press no on naming yourself and we can generate a entirely new seed. I would typically just reset at this point, but if you're having problems syncing, this is an option. Now from here, you're going to want to name your rival A as well, as this essentially saves a few seconds along the way as text scrolls by a little bit slow in Generation 3, so naming your trainer, naming yourself, and naming your Squirtle A is efficient. Once we're actually inside of the game, go into your trainer ID, hit clear TID at the bottom left if you have anything in the box, go ahead and input your trainer ID into the program, and then hit the search button. This will bring up a listing of Squirtles that we can use the arrow keys on our keyboard to scroll up and down on. So what we want to do now is we're going to go to the frame section of whatever really good Squirtle that we find. We're going to put that frame of the Squirtle that we find into Flow Timer. So go over here, put in those four numbers, and then go ahead and submit. This is going to start a timer in the background, and once it's reached the point where it's about to count down, you will either hear beeps, or see a visual, or both. And once it's counted down to the final beep, you want to time your A press the exact second you hear that final beep. Right on this text box. And with that, either you hit it, or you missed it. And depending on if you missed it or not, this is actually not even a big deal. If you happen to miss your Squirtle, that's okay. We can easily check how far we were off by. So go ahead and click on your Squirtle, hit search around frame button at the bottom, and then you can scroll up and down and see which stats actually match yours. Again, level five stats will be on the right, so if it matches yours with the nature as well, you'll be able to know how off you were by. If this happens enough, again, do not be afraid to change your offset with the equation that I gave you guys earlier. And if you happen to hit your god Squirtle, well congratulations. You have just stepped into the world of Pokemon Fire Red Leaf Green speedrunning. So the next thing I'm going to be teaching you guys is when you should be prioritizing a Squirtle over another Squirtle. So typically, when it comes to natures, mild is the least valuable nature of all three of the natures because of its minus defense nature. Because of the physical special splits, you are more likely to get hit with a physically damaging move than a specially damaging move. And because of this, you end up taking a lot more damage and you are more likely to, in the long run, end up dying if you run a mild nature over a modest or rash nature. Now, when it comes to modest versus rash nature, it very much depends on what you're willing to risk in the long run. For modest nature, they typically outshine a rash nature if and only if they have good enough attack. Because of modest nature's lack of attack, they can typically end up missing a range. But because a modest nature does not have a minus nature in special defense or defense, they can be very, very valuable in the long run as they are less likely to die because of their superior defenses. So, if you have an overall more balanced, modest nature with a really good attack, then you typically want to prioritize a rash nature over a modest nature. But if you have, I would say about 0 to 21 attack on a modest nature, sometimes you want to prioritize a rash nature over a modest nature. As 0 to 3 attack on a rash or mild nature typically would equal up to a modest nature. So if you have like higher attack or any sort of attack that equals up to a 0 to 3 rash or mild nature, then again, pick the you would typically pick the modest nature over the other two. Now, in terms of special attack, 28 and 29 special attack can be an absolute nightmare to use as it is a 59.4% chance to 2 KO Misty's Staryu. And the reason why this is so important is because if you miss the two shots on Staryu, she typically leads off with Harden, but the second turn, a lot of the time, she's either going to be going for a Water Pulse or a Tackle. Very, very rarely she is going to use Tackle. 
Most of the time, she's going to be using Water Pulse, and Water Pulse has a 20% chance to confuse you. And this is a huge problem because you do not want to be confused in the middle of that fight, and you also do not want to force her into healing. This wastes a lot of time and is very, very inconsistent if she ends up not dying to a two-shot. Now, 30-31 to 31 IV special attack also has a lot more benefits as well. They can typically one-shot a couple of things that you would miss with 28 or 29 special attack. Usually, most of the time, I would indefinitely prioritize a 30 to 31 IV in special attack over 20 to 29 special attack if the defense and overall balance of the Squirtle is better than that 28 to 29 special attack Squirtle. Now, the next thing we want to consider in terms of stats is going to be speed. Speed is pretty decently important as sometimes you end up having to set up less, which more than likely than not, you end up dying less the less that you actually have to set up. So, speed can be a very, very important tool in terms of the speed run. So, 16 to 18 speed, you are forced to grab a Carbos because you're more likely than not going to be outsped or speed tie Lorelei's Jinx, Bruno's Hitmonlee, as well as Giovanni's Doug Trio, mostly depending on the level. You're also likely going to have to do a different EXP order depending on what speed you have. Now, 19 to 25 speed, however, does not need the Carbos whatsoever, but it does have to be able to take a hit from Blaine's Growlithe. Now, if after the Koga fight you are struggling on health, you have maybe like, I would say maybe about 20 health, you have to heal, which wastes a little bit more time. You also have to set up, which also wastes a little bit more time, so keep that in mind as well. Now, 26 to 28 speed is a very, very nice sweet spot, as you can grab the Carbos before Blaine, and you should be able to outspeed Blaine's Rapidash as long as you grab the Carbos, or if you have the very special case of having a 28 IV in speed, all you have to do is kill one extra Pokemon along the way, typically a Rattata or a Pidgey, which give a single speed EV, and you're good to go on outspeeding. 29 speed is a very weird spot, as it's guaranteed to outspeed Blaine's Rapidash, but it does not outspeed Sabrina's Alakazam, even with a Carbos, unfortunately. Now, for 30 to 31 IV speed, though, this is a very awesome case where you can actually outspeed Sabrina's Alakazam, and you won't have to deal with her Venomoth having to set up an extra X speed and not having to deal with a potential 10% to confuse yourself or a 6% to actually get crits on that Venomoth. So, again, if you have really good speed, you deal with less damage and less setup. If you have bad speed, you may have to take a different EXP route and potentially even have to set up on a fight that you really don't want to set up on and hopefully not die on as well. So keep all of this in mind. Before I set you guys off into the world of Pokemon Fire and Leaf Green speedrunning, there is one final technique I can teach you all. This is bag manipulation or spinner manipulation. This trainer right here, you see how he's facing in all sorts of random different directions? This is what we speedrunners like to call a spinner. Spinners are trainers that can move in any random four directions at any given time, and they have a 25% chance to face any direction whatsoever. The unfortunate thing is, is sometimes these trainers will face your direction and cause you to end up in a battle that you don't want to be a part of. So, in order to be able to not deal with these trainers whatsoever, we need a way to manipulate them. So, what we're going to do is, step one, go into our bag. Step two, get out of our bag, start, take a single step, and then immediately go back into the bag. What going into the bag essentially does is it causes the spinner's internal clock to set itself to zero, giving us a total of 31 frames before the NPC is able to move again. And seeing as walking like this is actually 16 total frames, we have plenty of time to actually be able to pass him. Now, if you try to run, he's going to actually see you. But if you walk you are guaranteed to be able to pass him, as you can see. 
But you only have 16 frames to do it, so you're only able to take one step and 100% guarantee that you are actually able to pass him. Now, there is another trick to this as well. And it's a little bit more advanced, but what you could do is you could do the bag manipulation. Step run. As long as you walk one step towards the trainer, you could actually run as soon as you are on the actual tile that he can actually face towards you. And this ends up being very, very useful as this forces any and all spinners to be able to be manipulated. So the unfortunate thing is though, is this method does not work if you only bring up the main menu. You have to go into any one of these different sub menus. Yeah, as you can see, he is constantly spinning. So we can go into either the Pokedex, the Pokemon bag, the bag, the trainer ID, or the options menu. These are all the different ways you can do it. So if you happen to be on one menu versus the other, you can actually do that. Now there is one final way to actually be able to manipulate these guys, and that is TM case manip. So there is a point in time whenever you go inside of Mount Moon that you're going to register the TM case. And this is for a couple of reasons. One, you want to teach a couple TMs, and two, you can use this to manipulate spinners. As you can see, this is much, much faster than actually having to go into the bag. I'll show you one more example of the actual bag manip versus the TM case manip. It's very simple. It saves a little bit of time in the long run, and it is definitely, definitely worth learning. The only time TM case manipulation is not worth doing is whenever you have something else registered onto select, which the only other item that you would really need to register is your bike. And by that point in time, bike movement is going to take precedence over actual TM case manipulation. So keep that in mind. So now that we know bag manipulation, there is one last trick that I can teach you guys, and that is another another way to pass a different trainer, which I like to call walkers. Walkers are essentially trainers that do not react to your movement whatsoever. All these guys ever react to is their internal clock telling them to move up and down. And with this, there's only one problem with these guys, which is their vision. So as long as they... If they immediately face down or up and you want to pass them as they go down or up, you can. Or you can take the time out of your day if you want to play it a little bit safe to actually be able to pass them. This girl in particular, she will actually see you from the very top of this point right here. So the only real way to be able to pass her efficiently is one, you could wait until she looks down and then just run past her immediately. Two, you could play it safe, wait till she looks down, and then do the bag manipulation, forcing her to stay still and long enough to be able to pass her. Or three, you can go all the way down here, and if she eventually comes down, you'll see that she actually can't see you whatsoever. Even if she were to actually walk into the grass right here, as you can see, her vision is about three tiles. And unfortunately, that does equal up to enough to be to not be able to pass her as long as she's looking up, unfortunately. So, again, if you want a little bit of safety, you can bag manip her. And I'm actually also going to throw a list of other walkers and showcase them on the screen right now. So you guys can be wary of those trainers and be careful along the way to greatness in speedrunning Pokemon Fire Red Leaf Green. If you enjoyed this video... Why not leave a like, subscribe, and hit that bell so you can know the next time that I post a Pokemon speedrunning video, whether it be a tutorial, a personal best, it's all there for you. Be sure to comment below as well and let me know what Pokemon speedrunning tutorial I should cover next. Otherwise, thanks for watching. I'll see you all next time.